Hello everyone and welcome to Tabor Talk. I'm your host, Michael Tabor. What a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Beautiful full day. I actually had my winter jacket on and now I took it off. It's just so gorgeous. So um, anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about my YouTube channel, which I started, I guess, a couple of months ago. Um, it started out real kind of really had this incredible momentum right from the get-go like my first month I had like I don't know over 10,000 views and like like 20 subscribers maybe less the first month the subscribership was pretty down and then I and then it kept going going and then it's kind of leveled off a bit like so today I have I don't even check the views or um, I have um, YouTube analytics, so I could check out the time and this and that, where the traffic's coming from and all this and that. Um, uh, but I have now 77 subscribers, and I've been at, like, in the 70s for, like, three or four weeks. So, like, up and down, 72, back to 70, 72, 73, 74, back down. And uh, you really shouldn't pay too close attention to that. But anyway... Um, I am going to play a little bit of Tim Ferriss. This is episode number 78. This is in a podcast he did on 2015 when Tim was sort of starting out. And he says, how to build an audience, how to build... Now, Tim Ferriss is famous and, you know, everyone knows who Tim Ferriss is. Um, at the time, he I guess he had a couple of million unique visitors to his blog and uh, his podcast and... And social media, Twitter followers, and all that. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of this. And you might say, hey, I'll just go directly to Tim Ferriss, the Tim Ferriss podcast, that episode. Why am I going to listen to Michael Tabor, Tabor Talk? That's fine. That's perfectly fine with me. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but just a little bit of a clip here. Here's another thing I thought. I was talking to my wife, Madeline. Well, let's just say this thing takes off, right? And I get hundreds of thousands of subscribers, maybe a million. Who knows? And this becomes something that is makes money. I don't. I do this for nothing. I do this for free. I'm retired, and you know, semi-retired, if you will. And and this is. I'm doing this because I love it. That's all there is to it. I don't. I really don't care if if I make money on this or not. You know. So right now I'm doing it for zero. I have. Um, I have no budget. Whatever. So. But anyway, let's just say hypothetically, I definitely wouldn't like it. I mean, it's like I'm here in the Catskills because I want to relax. You know, I worked my whole life and, uh, you know, I have this illness I'm dealing with and I'm doing this for fun. So if I start getting all these subscribers, then it's going to become W, work. And it's like, do I want that? Okay, I do and I don't. But let me play some of the Tim Ferriss podcast, by the way. He is my new girlfriend now. My new podcast girlfriend, Tim. I have six of them, but he's the fucking best, man. I love this dude. So awesome. From Long Island, too, fellow Long Islander. Here we go. Much. The Tim Ferriss Show is typically involved with deconstructing world-class performers, trying to identify the routines, too close, the so. tips, the books, the influences, and so on, that help you okay. to replicate the successes of people who are the very best at what they do, whether they are hedge fund managers, actors, and politicians like Governor Schwarzenegger, for instance, yep. uh, musicians like Mike Shinoda. This is like a half-hour solo blah, from Tim. I'm not going to play the whole thing. Projects. Just a little We've bit so you get some of the good points. Now, every once in a while, I do a Q&A format where people will vote on questions, submit and upvote questions, just like you have in the past week or two. So several thousand people voted on questions, and I have While the you're top 10 to 15 I'm going to this, tackle. I'm going to show you what I do. I Hold, I have coffee. In the next short stint, and I have the short period that we have together before I have I take every day CBD so, oil. Let me start at the beginning and then before we so jump into the questions. I'll be quiet. I'm going to take my cradle. I'll show you. You can see what I did with a spoon. Put it between picks. my cheek and gum rather than putting it in a tip. And I uncover some pretty fun ones because I dig very deep. And I search far and wide for lots of weird esoteric stuff. <laughs> if you go to fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, F-O-U-R-H-O-U-R, etc. Fourhourworkweek.com forward slash Vimeo. Many different Vimeo streams I use. 
Red and Bane. I have been a member for power. many years now. Uh, if you go to fourhourworkweek.com forward slash Vimeo, you can find some of the movies that have been amazing for me, inspiring, game changing, or in some cases life changing. Him, he loves movies just really, like me. You know, he's really talking about film. movies. And before I've spoken about, for instance, a science fiction short called See? World of Tomorrow, which See was that? the winner of the Grand Jury Prize just... at Sundance for short films and is just a really thought provoking, mm -hmm. intense 16 minutes or so. I've mentioned Waking Up with Sam Harris, which is actually a lecture and effectively a class which is the perfect tool if you want to explore mindfulness and meditation. And for those of you who have listened to a lot of these podcasts, you know that perhaps 80% of the top performers all have some type mm -hmm. of meditative practice, and it can differ, uh, whether that is, say, a DJ or founder of the Glitch Mob all the way to Schwarzenegger. They all have some type of mindfulness practice. Then you have the, the act of killing, which is probably the most brutal innovative documentary I've ever seen uh, and many more so they they have uh, just about anything you can imagine from documentaries on the revival of manual work through motorcycles which is super cool you can check that out a breakdancing documentary and the one that I want to highlight today is a very short film called The Lady in Number Six is, uh, and The Lady in Number Six listen. is an Oscar winner it is a short about Alice. Now, Alice is 109 years old Holy and the world's God. oldest pianist and oh, Holocaust gross. survivor. And this short film is really mind-expanding for me, uh, was mind-expanding for me in a number of respects. It just shows the importance of mental framing and also how your perspective can lead to happiness or resentment at any given point in time. And there are a number of people in the film who appear besides Alice, and you can look at the their demeanors and the contrast and perspectives. It's very, very interesting. But 109 years old, very, very sharp, still moving Incredible. around, playing the piano every day. Incredible. I found it a, a really enlightening and I love stories uh, like that. Tell you, a 109 year old woman it's, playing it's only, the piano. You know, 20 to 30 minutes long. So, so fucking the, inspiring. The, uh, name again is The Lady in Number Six. You can go to 4hourweek.com forward slash Vimeo, and I'll be continuing to add movies to this page. Uh, they are not affiliate links, but I do have a discount for you guys for any of the films that you might watch, so you can check that out. Uh, but the subtitle is Listen to the Secrets for a Long and Happy Life. So the lady in number six, check it out. It's short, well worth the time. Go to 4hourworkweek.com forward slash Vimeo. All right, now, moving on. Let's get to the very first question, just jump into it. And uh, I think I'll spend a good amount of time on uh, this question. And I've omitted a handful of those that were voted up because I thought the wording was weird or confusing. Um, so the first one I'm going to tackle is this question from Mike in Santa Cruz. They say not blogging 1.0 is dead. If you had to build an audience from scratch today, building how would you Listen start? This. Well, this is a tricky question because uh, uh, you may be tackling the wrong problem. And let me explain how I think about this. And just to, to put things in perspective, so I have a number of platforms. Uh, I obviously have the blog, which gets somewhere between, I don't know, uh, one and two million unique visitors per month. Uh, then I have my Twitter and social. Twitter alone gets, I don't know, 1.3 million or so in terms of followers. And then the podcast, which is hundreds of thousands uh, per episode, and so on and so forth. So I've tried it all, right? I've played around with any platform you can imagine, and I live in Silicon Valley and invest in tech. Here's my perspective. So I'll answer your question somewhat directly and literally first. There is always a market for high quality, That's and there's right. always a market for long form. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to recommend a couple of resources right off the bat. Uh, there's always a market for high quality. Uh, there's a book called Small Giants I would recommend that you check out. Uh, and this is to say if you offer the best of anything – uh, you can charge a premium, and your customers will tend, will tend to be very high-margin, low-headache customers. So you could, so say, produce the best cigar in the world or even in the top 10% and charge hundreds or thousands of dollars per cigar. You could do the That's same crazy, thing with it? leather pants. True, so people right? like Sheryl Crow and only make a couple of hundred or even fewer per year and make hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars per year. That's actually an example That's so from crazy, Small Giants. Right? That's true. This is related to long form, and that's how I interpret blogging 1.0, is writing blog posts and then having comments on those posts. There's always a market for long form, and people 
lament the death of long form, the death of this, the death of that. Oh my God, you know, TV is going to be the death of radio, podcasts are going to be the death of this, and this is going to be the death of that. And it makes for very sensational headlines, but uh, Tony, that's why I'm in shape. I have a health issue, but hot air. So long form. If you looked at me, you wouldn't be able to tell. Content, and I've always specialized. I think when you see me walk, I'm fucked up. Don't get me wrong. They're not short. They're not. Just looking at me for, sitting here, I don't look uh, like people who claim part. to have short attention spans. And many of my blog posts are 15 pages long, 20, 30 pages long if you print them out. Uh, and the reason I approach it this way is because if you're building an audience, and I'll come back to that aspect of your question, the, the most labor-efficient way to build an audience over time is – to have evergreen content. So I write long pieces that will be more valuable from an SEO uh, real estate standpoint two years from the date I write it compared to the week it launches, if that makes sense. SEO stands so for search you, engine optimization. You to look at my I'm back sure you catalog that, and the but... stats, I'm on WordPress VIP. If you were to look at my stats... I'm learning myself. I'm not good at all. You would I... see that my most popular posts... I don't even think hard, about it. Get, I, just, get I just turn the recorder on. I'm not good at production. Per month, I don't think about it at all. Several so this is ago. for me, really. That's uh, very much by design. I'm not upset by that because I, ex- I fully expect that some of the articles I write this year, for instance, my post on... Uh, practical Sorry, thoughts on suicide, which is a very intense post. Uh, I expect that will continue to gather steam and be spread around and shared. And a year from now, it will be right in the top 10 rankings, which is very important to me. So the question you asked, though, has very uh, is, is a multi-layered question, and there are a lot of assumptions built into it. So if you had to build an audience from scratch today, let's examine that. Why do you have to build an audience at all. Now, the the belief right now is you have to be on social, you have to be putting out content. I think that's bullshit. You don't have to at all. Amazon didn't start with building an audience. Uber didn't start with building an audience. So if your goal is to create a profitable or massively scaled business, that may not be the right thing to focus on. Uh, totally agree. That's, that's part one. Uh, part two is I, I encourage you to always ask yourself why three times when you feel like you have to do something. So you have to build an audience. Ask three times. And this is something I think I adopted from Ricardo Semler, just spelled with an R. He's a Brazilian entrepreneur. Asking why three times. So why do you have to build an audience? Well, and you might say, because I have to have people to sell to when I launch my product. Okay, well, why do you have to launch your product? Well, because I want to build a business that allows me to the freedom, let's just say, to travel the world and have enough income to do A, B, and C. All right, let's take travel the world. It may turn out, once you ask why three times, that volunteering at a local embassy for your target country, like Sweden or someplace else, is the shortest path to getting to your objective, not building an audience. So don't mistake so good. the intermediate signposts, or not even signposts, the intermediate steps that you've been told repeatedly are important as the goal itself. Uh, And this this comes back to a lot of the discussion in the four-hour work week about multiple currencies and the fact that income is only one currency. You have time, you have mobility, and that the value of that money is determined by the number of W's you control in your life, where you live, what you do, who you spend your time with, and so on. And the reality that income is a barter system, you are taking this paper or digital uh, symbolism, basically these units, and trading them for experiences or possessions. So there may That's be exactly more direct right. That's ways, exactly it, what mine is. like volunteering, like taking a specific job, uh, any number of things uh, that could get you to your goal faster than building an audience. Because building an audience, quite frankly, let me just step away here. I'm going to continue is, on. Uh, it is Enjoy. not an easy thing, and it requires a very concerted, conscious, and well planned effort. Okay, a couple of uh, other recommendations. If you still decide that building an audience is the right step or the right uh, place to focus, a couple of things I would suggest. Read the article 1,000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. Uh, this is an important concept to grasp because you do not want to target the mass, the masses. 
your objective should not be to build the largest audience possible. It's too vague. It will be too expensive in terms of cost per acquisition, even if that cost is measured in the man hours that you put into creating content. The least crowded channel is where you should focus. That's another reason why I prefer long-form content. The least crowded channel is still long-form content, whether that is print or audio. And that is why I am able to compete effectively, for instance, in the podcast realm, even though my podcasts are very minimally produced. I don't have a team. It's me and one freelance engineer and my assistant. That's it. Uh, But I can compete against podcasts that have many, 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 many people and groups of people focused on producing a narrative. I don't have any of because this is me, I, myself, I and I. I don't guests. have an engineer. I don't this, have this an episode, assistant. of course, being uh, an exception. I mean, an anomaly. A few other points. If you're trying to build an audience, the first place to start, and this is going to sound funny, is to look at your credit card statement. All right, look at your monthly credit card statements and identify where you are price and sens- and price insensitive. Okay, so you could have a, a specific highlighter for that. Let's just say they're printed out. Use an orange highlighter, red, whatever, for things that you are price insensitive about, where you could spend three or four times as much and not care. You should also break things into groups. Where do you spend $100 a year? Okay, so obviously you're going to have to divide some things or multiply them by 12. But what do you spend $100 a year on? What do you spend $250 a year on? What do you spend $500 a year on? And what do you spend $1,000 a year on? Uh, And if you're in a a, a very high income bracket, then you can multiply those out, obviously. Okay, that's step one. And the price and sensitive aspect is very important if you want minimal headache from the customers that you choose. Next, you're going to identify the subcultures that you belong to. What are the subcultures you belong to? Are you a CrossFitter? Are you involved with orienteering? Are you into role-playing games, World of Warcraft? Do you like particular types of movie? Are you uh, into Japanimation? Whatever it is, identify three to five subcultures that you belong to that you understand very well. And then for each of those subcultures, you're going to identify the five sites that those people go to. If you had to guess where someone in that subculture would go, the five sites that they go to regularly, three to five, the three to five Twitter accounts they're most likely to follow, the three to five Instagram accounts they're most likely to follow, the three to five Facebook pages they're most likely to like or be fans of, the three to five podcasts that they're likely to listen to, and let's just stop it there, and you don't have to do all of them, but spec that out, and what are you doing by following this process? What you're doing is defining yourself, your psychographics, your demographics, and uh, my, my first recommendation is always going to be go after markets that you belong to. So when I launched the four-hour work week, my objective was initially, and the target is not the potential market. This is really important to understand. The, the, the target market is not your total market. The target market is the tip of the spear. That is what you use at the front lines to win the battle that then allows you to win the war. But you win the war when your target demographic then expands to include a lot of other people. In practical terms, what does this mean? When I launched the four-hour work week, my objective was very measurable. And what gets measured gets managed. As Peter Drucker says, I was going after... I love that. What gets measured gets managed. ...sales of the four-hour work week per week to... I think it was 20 to 35-year-old tech-savvy males in New York and San Francisco predominantly, Chicago also. Um, and I don't know what my demographic is. is you know? Nielsen book scan. I had right. a good idea of what I'm here. Just listen. The New York Times bestseller list. I knew what type of distribution I needed, hence the importance of Chicago and having uh, not only sales limited to the coasts. And I also knew that I belonged to this 25 to uh, 40-year-old, is that what I said? <laughs> 25 to 40-year-old tax saving male demographic. Therefore, I knew how to appear ubiquitous to these people in a cost-effective way. So follow me. I knew that if I were able to get on at the time, say Gizmodo, TechCrunch, uh, Gawker perhaps, and a handful of other sites, then, uh, now Twitter was nascent in this day and Instagram didn't exist, but if I was able to appear at say two or three or four conferences that these people attended... I could appear as though I'm spending millions of dollars 
uh, or being recruited by all these companies and publications around the world when, in fact, I only was targeting a handful in a very concerted and uh, surgical way. Okay, you're not trying to build the largest audience possible. You're trying to find your 1,000 true fans. So to bring it home, just review all this stuff. You're trying to find your 1,000 true fans who belong to. Hello, everyone. So I was just over there in the other corner of the cabin. So that you can then design a working out, doing some shadow boxing and jumping rope. That's what I do. I listen to these podcasts and I work out. And Enjoy. Well, let me in doing all of that, finding so. a handful of outlets or pages uh, or accounts that you can target so you can very cost-effectively appear ubiquitous in a surround sound way when you launch something important to you. And that is it. By focusing on the least crowded channel, you can win at surprisingly low cost and with very elegant surgical approaches. And uh, that is a long answer to question number one. So <laughs> I'm going to go get a glass of water, but hopefully you guys find that useful. And okay. I will be back. That's all I wanted to you to play for us. Question number one, how okay, to build I'm an back, audience. You gorgeous, filthy animals. And I'm Tim is great, isn't he? A speed round. Yeah. Uh, at least. So he was answering questions, but how to build um, an audience. Uh, how to build up your YouTube channel, your blog, your podcast, and all that. So I'm like 20 minutes in. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I did so. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what to think. Do I want it? Um, do I want Taper Talk to really get big, or do I just want to keep it like this? It really doesn't matter to me. And I guess that's a that's a good thing because I don't have the pressure. You know, it's not like like this is all I'm doing. And if I don't get subscribers, I'm gonna starve. You know. Okay. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Check out Tim Ferriss, man. He is the best. I got all shit in my teeth. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's the Kratom. Okay. Uh, good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience. Peace, love, and understanding here on Tabor Talk.